um, the prophetic outline. It's called The Shaking and is found in both volume 1 of the Testimonies and in early writings page 269. 269 to about page 271. Now this particular prophecy is given in a rather interesting fashion. I'll just discuss first of all the structure of the chapter or the, or the structure of the vision and then we'll begin to look at it in more detail. First of all, Sister White uh, was shown a picture, a picture of turmoil, of uh, agonizing prayer, of shaking and separation. And then she asked and was given the reason or the cause of this turmoil in the church. When that was complete, a second um, picture was given to her, and again the cause, and finally a third picture, which is the loud cry. And we'll find that this chapter, although it talks in different language or uses different expressions, is a very clear confirmation of the points we've seen so far in, in the chapter on the ten virgins. So I'll start to read now from page 269. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. And again the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. Evil angels crowded around, pressing darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounded them and thus they be led to distrust God and murmur against him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes directed upwards. Angels of God had charge over his people and as the poisonous atmosphere of evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the heavenly angels were continually wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness. As the praying ones continued their earnest cries, at times a ray of light from Jesus came to them to encourage their hearts and light up their countenances. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their powers to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who had made no effort to help themselves and I lost sight of them. And there's the first picture, a description of a polarization of church membership. One group, naturally of course the smaller of the two, deeply concerned over their spiritual welfare pleading with God for light, for peace and for victory, while the other group seemed indifferent and careless, made no effort to resist the darkness around them, and Sister White lost sight of them, they disappeared from view. And before we identify where this uh, struggle is taking place on the diagram on the board, let's discover what causes this shaking or this stirring in the church. It's called a shaking, which means of course a separation. Sister White says, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that they would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to lay the sins. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the, the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear the straight testimony, they will rise up against it and this is what will cause a shaking amongst God's people. Now, I mentioned to you, I think, yesterday or the day before, just forgotten which day now, that um, there have been a succession of attempts on God's part through the prophet and through Wagner and Jones and again today to lift the people of God out of the Laodicean condition. The first effort was back uh, when Miller was sent to the Sardis Church with the Gospel, the second in 1857, the third in 1859, the next in 1888, and the next one is in progress at the present moment. <clears throat> now, 
this particular prophecy has to apply to the last effort of God although every time God uh, sends the lad of sin message must at least begin the, prophet, the prophecy must begin but if the, if the lay of the sin message fails to do its work thoroughly and completely because of the hardness of God's people's hearts then of course the end time prophecy is not going to be fulfilled now we're concerned today with the complete fulfilment from start to finish and uh, it is our hope and expectation that we are today in the, in, the course or in the course of the complete fulfillment of this prophecy because as we shall shortly learn the climax or combination comes in the actual latter rain and loud cry itself on the very next page. So then let's come back now and uh, begin to identify or to relate this prophecy to the one we have here on the board. Now, Sister Wife has shown that the shaking in the church was caused by the presentation of the Laodicean message. We've learned over the past couple of days that the Laodicean message is, in fact, the third angel's message in verity. It's the message which Wagner and Jones taught back in 1888. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's therefore the fourth angel's message. And we know that back in 1950, the message which was brought to the church at that point of time was no less than all of that. The Laodicean message, the, the third angel's message in verity and therefore the loud cry of the fourth angel or the fourth angel which is the loud cry of the third angel I should say, the gospel of Jesus Christ and so forth but particularly of course the Laodicean message. Now when that message came back in the 1950s it certainly produced the effect in the church described in these paragraphs. And no doubt you're well aware of the fact that there have been a succession of men ever since the Adventist Church was formed who have risen up claiming to be the preachers of the Laodicean message but whose message has been largely a recital of church deficiencies and church sins and church short, short, church's shortcomings. In other words, a message of condemnation not a gospel presentation. And I've watched some of these men come and go and I have failed to see any of them with their message produce the shaking in the church described in early writings. Now I can testify of course to, um, to having passed through this original basic experience and no doubt many of you even though you've come into the movement later can also recall how you went through a struggle, a Romans 7 struggle, an agonizing period where you prayed and looked for victory and never found it and kept looking and praying and trying and seeking struggling and resisting the darkness around about you until finally you did break through into a victorious experience. Some did this more easily than others. Some I, I know from my contact with people who have gone through quite a period of effort and struggle to come out of darkness into light. Now just as the study on the ten virgins shows that there were people who did not resist the darkness, who maintained their connection with earthly things, and they were lost sight of, so the same class of people is brought to view in this particular presentation. Let me draw your attention to them again. It says, um, Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. And we recognized or identified three different groups of people, the wise virgins, the foolish virgins, and the rejecters of God's message. Into which of those three categories would you obviously place those who seemed indifferent and careless and were not resisting the darkness around about them and it shut them in like a thick cloud? Which of the three classes? The wise virgins? Foolish virgins? Rejectors? Right, the rejectors. They were the rejectors of the message. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves and I lost sight of them. And don't forget those last words, Sister White, lost sight of them, the same as these rejectors in this parable were also lost sight of at that particular point of time. Now this is a very sad thing to say of course because those who have been lost sight of are still good church members back in the organisation. They're still occupying the role of ministers, of church elders, of uh, deacons and Sabbath school teachers and fondly resting in the assurance that they are God's true children but the real fact is that they have been lost sight of. 
I don't refer, of course, to the hidden ones back in the church organisations of the Roman Catholic Church, Protestants, Adventists and so on. They are yet to receive their opportunity. But those who have had the chance, those who have neglected to reach out and lay hold upon the victory, they've been lost sight of and no longer come into God's figuring for the last day events. Now, <clears throat> let's down notice the, um, the message again. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be called, it would be called by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to lay the sins. Now we have an expression, I gave it to him straight. I guess, I guess you use it too, don't you, in North America? I gave it him straight, I told him straight. And when you hear a person say that, in your mind you have a picture of that person going and, and wagging his finger in the other guy's face and saying, you're a so-and-so and so-and-so. <laughs> It's, 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 an, it's an accusing approach. Now, I don't believe for one moment that is the meaning of the word here, the straight testimony. This message is straight in the sense, in the sense that it is right down the line. There are no ifs and there are no buts. It's a very precise message, very procedural. And um, we spell it out with, with great care and we know that if we deviate from the very accurate presentation of this message, it just doesn't work. Now back in Christ's day, of course, the Pharisees, the scribes and um, Sadducees and teachers and the rabbis and teachers and so forth, they talked in riddles. There was nothing certain, nothing sure. Everything was yes, well, maybe this way and yes, but this way and so forth. When Christ came, he came with an authority, with a clarity, with a certainty that was literally a straight testimony. It was straight and clear. And I think you folk would agree with me that this message is like that, isn't it? It's very straight and to the point. You know what it, you know you know what the message is when you've heard it. But uh, you'll also recognise that back in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, you're left with all kinds of grey areas and and anything but black and white areas. So I think the word straight testimony here doesn't mean straight in the sense of a telling off, but rather straight in the sense of being right down the line, accurate and truthful, reliable, consistent, and recognisable. Now, this will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver. The straight testimony will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver. Now, whenever did the denunciation have an effect upon the heart of a receiver? Never. Denunciation only hardens the mind against the person making the denunciations. Whereas the living gospel, presented in straight, clear lines, does have an effect upon the heart of the receiver and leads him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Now some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it and this is what will cause a shaking amongst God's people. Now of course um, some people are probably thinking in their minds, well doesn't the Bible say um, blow the trumpet in Zion and show my people there a lift up the trumpet and oh, what's the text say again back in Isaiah? I've got an exact chapter now but um, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm in my holy mountain, show my people their sins and the house of Israel their transgressions. Remember that text? Yes, page, chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions and the house of, of Jacob their sins. Now because our minds have been geared for so long to the idea of denouncing sin by, by calling, it, calling it for what it is, uh, we, we think in terms of fulfilling that counsel by going out and lifting and cataloguing and naming all the sins of Israel and pointing out how wrong those sins are. Now, do you find Wagner and Jones preaching that kind of message? We don't, do we? And they preach the light that God gave them to preach. And um, that, that, that is not the way they presented the truth. Now, there's a far better way of crying out aloud and sparing not, of showing my people their transgression, the house of Israel their sins, Teach the living truth, the positive, glorious power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in the flood, the flood uh, light of that message, you'll find that sin is exposed to what it is, and people will, will be convicted of sin, not by not by your time it is sin, but because the light of the gospel exposes sin to be what it is, and. Um, that kind of exposure, of course, is, um, is very valuable and very effective. Let me just go ahead a little bit in my morning worship series on the woman of Samaria and note the um, way in which Jesus Christ handled this problem with the woman who had to be brought to the place where she did recognise her, um, 
her sinfulness, and but, but Christ didn't do it by condemnation. Page 189, Desire of Ages. Christ has just calmly said to her, yes, you've said right, you, you don't have a husband, you've had, but you've had five, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. You've spoken the truth, he said. And so Sister Wife says, Jesus had convinced her that he read the secrets of her life, yet she felt that he was a friend, pitying and loving her. While the very purity of his presence condemned her sin, he has spoken no word of denunciation. Note that he has spoken no word of denunciation, but have told her of his grace that could renew the heart or the soul. She began to have some conviction of his character. And when the woman taken in adultery was brought to Christ, he said to her, Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Now I like that kind of approach. I found in my own work it's much more effective than running up and saying, look, you must stop doing this sin. You're, you're a so-and-so sinner. You better stop doing these things. I found only hardens hearts against the truth rather than, soften, rather than to soften them. The next little paragraph on page 270 in early writings reads as follows. I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half-heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who, all who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. Today, the commonly held belief in the Adventist world is this. We are God's chosen people. God called us to be his uh, channels of light to the world. We are the Laodicean church, the very last in the seven of the prophecy of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And there's no way that we shall ever be uh, dislodged from our position. And they, they literally challenge heaven and earth to deprive them of what they believe to be their rights. But a church's future does not hang upon the fact that they were called in the past to be his channels of light to the world. This statement plainly says... The solemn testimony upon, upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly extended, not entirely disregarded. In other words, the question as to where the church will be in the, in the future or, or is at the present moment of time hinges on the way in which that message has been received or has been rejected. If the message is received and allowed to do its deep work of repentance in the heart of the hearer, then the future of the church is secure, at least until a change takes place. But if the church turns us back upon the solemn words of admonition long enough, and of course we've seen in the other prophecy until two calls have been given, then what is the fate of that church? Rejection and separation from God. And the future of the church hangs upon the way in which this message is received. Note these words again. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who receive it must uh, be but all who receive it will obey it and be purified. Now this completes the first picture and the, and the cause of that picture. And obviously, of course, we find ourselves looking at this period down here when the people of God have been receiving light from heaven and the division has taken place inside the church between those who accept the message and those who turn their backs upon it. Now, the gaze of Sister White and vision has now turned to another picture which we'll recognise as being up here in the tarrying time. Let's move on then to, see the, to, to read this. Said the angel, List ye, or listen. Soon I heard a voice like many musical instruments, all sounding in perfect strain, sweet and harmonious. It surpassed any music I'd ever heard, seeming to be full of mercy, compassion and elevating holy joy. It thrilled through my whole being, said the angel, Look ye! My attention was then turned to the company I had seen who were mightily shaken. I was shown those whom I had before seen weeping and praying in agony of spirits. The company of guardian, angel, the company of guardian angels around them had been doubled and they were clothed with an armour from their head to their feet. They moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. Their countenances expressed the severe conflict which they had endured 
The agonizing struggle they had passed through, yet their features, marked with severe internal anguish, now shone with the light and glory of heaven. They had obtained the victory and had called forth from them the deepest gratitude and holy sacred joy. The numbers of this company had lessened. Does that ring a bell? Here's the, here's the, here's the company here, the ones who've been mightily shaken, the ones who've been weeping in pain and agony of spirit. Now we find their numbers have been lessened by the shaking out at the first disappointment. So we find now the exact harmony between the chapter on the ten virgins and the chapter on the shaking coming through. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation after perseveringly plead for it and agonize for it did not obtain it and they were left behind in darkness and their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming to the ranks. Evil angels still pressed around them but could have no power over them. Now let's, take, let's pick up some of the important points in, um, in these two paragraphs. First I'll deal with the second paragraph and then go back to the earlier one. Um, as I just mentioned of course, the numbers had lessened, some had been shaken out and left by the way. Now who had been shaken out and left by the way? It says the careless and the indifferent. But those two words, or those three words, were used to describe the rejectors back at this point here. They were called the cursed and different versus those who were very concerned. And, yet, and we were told that they had been lost sight of back at that point in time and therefore would not again figure in the prophecy. But a little careful thought soon shows that a little distinction is being introduced here which was not previously introduced in the prophecy. It says the careless and different who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it, did not obtain it, etc. Now what is the key word introduced here to give us a fine little distinction? Right, perseveringly. In other words, back here, the rejectors of God's mercy did not plead or agonize at all. Not at all. But the concerned company would divide the two classes, not mentioned back at this point, mentioned up here, those who perseveringly pleaded for victory and those who did not perseveringly plead for it. They both pleaded. They both agonized. But one group with perseverance until they got the victory, the other, the other group only for a short period of time. And um, if we just go back to Great Controversy a moment and compare this to what we read on page 394 in regard to the difference in, between the wise and foolish virgins it says the foolish have moved from impulse their fears have been excited by the solemn message but they had depended upon the faith of their brethren satisfied with the flickering light of good emotions without a thorough understanding of the truth or a genuine work of grace in the heart there was an understanding there was a work of grace but it was not thorough and it was not genuine and that makes the difference, of course, between the wise and the foolish virgin. So then, let's do some identifying again. First of all, we'll ask the question, who were they who did not agonize at all? Rejectors. Right, the rejectors. Who were they who did not perseveringly, who pleaded but not perseveringly for the victory? Foolish, foolish virgins. And who were they who pleaded perseveringly until they got the victory? Wise. The wise virgins. Good. What a brilliant class I've got. That wasn't sarcastic either. <laughs> now I think I, I, I've seen a lot of people struggle over this particular paragraph and they haven't been careful enough to read just what the paragraph says. That's why I'm being particular to make sure that you do identify these three groups of people and recognize the existence of the three. Now we're told then that um, there are these two classes of those who pleaded for victory, those who did persevering and those who did not do it perseveringly and when they were shaken out and left by the way, they were left behind in darkness and their places were immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth and coming to the ranks and remember I mentioned in our last study period that this chapter in the shaking would tell us that after this group would be shaken out left by the way, others would come in and take their places and you must recognize yourselves as being in that classification, right? That's, that's where you come into the picture. So you can see yourselves now in prophecy, isn't that nice? I think it is. <clears throat> now let's go back to the previous paragraph. 
there is ample evidence to prove that separation has taken place. First of all, Sister White hears the movements. And what she hears is something like many musical instruments all sounding in perfect strains, sweet and harmonious. It's, it surpassed any music I'd ever heard, seeming to be full of mercy, compassion, and elevating holy joy. Now, do you, do you get the inference that the musical instruments are all different? Violins, flutes, trumpets, uh, pianos, organs, um, and various string instruments and so forth. I get that impression. And, and that impression, of course, is symbolic to my mind of the fact that we're all different, all of us. Right? We all have different temperaments, different experiences, different levels of knowledge, different uh, convictions and so on. But um, under the uniting spirit of God we find ourselves moving together in perfect harmony. And this perfect harmony was so beautiful as Sister White describes it as being like many musical instruments all sounding in perfect strains, sweet and harmonious. A little further on it says that... The, that uh, that they moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. Now this to me speaks, speaks separation because how can you move in exact order if you're all mixed up with a church full of people going in 15 or 20 or 30 different directions? And you know today of course the confusion in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There are so many voices proclaiming this and that and the other thing. There are of course two main schools of thought there's the Laodicean Adventism and, and there's the so-called Evangelical Adventism which is not Adventism at all. It's a new hybrid that is really Babylonianism in its most subtle form. And apart from those two mainstreams, of course, the people these days seem to delight in coming up with their own individual little pet theories and, and theories and ideas. It's originality, they call it. It's really, of course, sparks their own kindling. Now, if we were today mixed up in that confusion, how could we all move together in exact order, order like a company of soldiers? A company of soldiers is uh, an orderly, united company of soldiers, all wearing the same uniform, of course, marching in the same direction. You cannot do that all mixed up with a great crowd of people, going in all different kinds of directions. One right. So this definitely gives the picture of separation from a confusing body. They moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. Now then, further thoughts about them. It says the company of guardian angels around them had been doubled. Which is a very encouraging thought, believe me. One person the other day said to me, I think it was back in Quebec when I gave some of these same studies back there, uh, they said, well, you know, before the, before the call comes, um, all the people in the church have, a, have an angel to guard them. But when, when there's a whole bunch of rejectors, a lot of angels suddenly find themselves out of work. <laughs> <laughs> and they're looking for employment, so God very graciously said, well, two of you, or, or twice, as many of you, twice as many of you now can guard these believers. So... All the angels who previously guarded all these now rejectors of the message now become the extra guardians of God's true people. Rather nice, isn't it? So the angel guard has doubled at this point of time and I'm glad for unemployment in the ranks of the angels. <laughs> I'm really sorry, you know, because I wish that all those folk would be saved too. And uh, it's appear that, appear that they do give up their angel guard and become open and unprotected to Satan's malice and devisings. Reading on we find their countenances expressed the severe conflict they had, they had endured, the agonizing struggle they had passed through, yet their features marked with severe internal anguish now shone with the light and glory of heaven. They had obtained the victory. Now the question arises, and again people are confused at this point, which victory? Is this the victory over the beast in his image, or is this the victory over sin? Well, there, there's ample evidence to show which victory it is. What do you folk, would you like to make a quick uh, suggestion? Over sin. Over sin? No one says over the beast in his image? Good. I don't either. And here's why. First of all, we see them in the church and um, struggling in response to the, to the Laodicean message. Now, what does the Laodicean message call us to victory over? over sin the latest sin message says that you're wretched miserable poor and blind and naked 
the latest sin message says that we are sinful in ourselves the latest sin message says you need gold white frame and a nice cell reach out and lay hold upon these things and the picture of a struggle to get that victory is portrayed in the early part of the chapter and now it says they had gotten the victory and this can only be victory over sin now further confirming evidence to this effect is found in the fact that what we're now reading is followed by the loud cry in latter rain and it's, during, it's at the end of the loud cry in the latter rain we get the victory over the beast in his image, right? not before it so the lay of the sin message gives us victory over sin that qualifies us to receive the latter rain which equips us to get the victory over the beast in his image doesn't it? certainly, so therefore the victory referred to here is the victory over sin and because of this they are clad in an armour from their head to their feet the armour of course being the armour of um, God including the sword of the spirit the breastplate of righteousness the shield of faith the helmet of salvation and shoes shod with the uh, gospel of peace so then we now have two pictures presented to us the first picture of course is the original struggle generated by the presentation of the sin message the second picture of a united separated church up here uh, rejoicing in the light of God living in the sweet victory of, over sin and being prepared to give the, la the loud cry and the latter rain power so what should we expect to find portrayed next in this particular prophecy the loud cry right the loud cry and that's, that's why the hidden ones brought out which is done during the loud cry both answers are quite correct and the very next paragraph says I heard those clothed with the armour speak forth the truth with great power it had effect many had been bound some wives by their husbands and some children by their parents the honest who had been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold upon it all fear of their relatives was gone and the truth alone was exalted to them they had been hungering and thirsting for truth it was dearer and more precious than life I asked what made this great change an angel answered it is the latter rain the refreshing from the presence of the Lord the loud cry of the third angel now this is the picture of the unbinding of those who have been bound by wives parents, ministers, friends and so forth I read that paragraph in our last study period I shall read it again now because to me it's a very precious paragraph page 3, 7, 2 and 3 in the book Great Controversy the statement says angels of God were watching with the deepest interest the result of the warning when there was a general rejection of the message by the churches angels turned away in sadness but there were many who had not yet been tested in regard to the advent truth many were misled by husbands, wives, parents or children and were made to believe it a sin even to listen to such heresies were taught by the Adventists angels were bidden to keep faithful watch over these souls for another light was yet to shine upon them from the, from the throne of God now while that refers to the 1844 situation it is equally true in the present situation because the parable is going through a second fulfilment and all the conditions prevailing back there must again prevail today and therefore in the Adventist church in, and, and even in the Protestant and Catholic churches there are tens of thousands of people and this praise God there are who at the present time are bound about by various circumstances and are unable to reach out and lay hold upon God's truth for this time now angels are watching over them very faithfully we don't have to worry about them some will mature earlier of course you folks did for instance and during this period there will be a steady stream of people coming out to take the place of those who will be taken out and left by the way but the majority of this class of person will remain in the churches until the loud cry comes and then there will come a great change now the Brinsmeys maintained the change was victory over sin but that's not the change at all let's read the paragraph again carefully to know what the change is I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power again here's a picture not the cause of the picture yet it had effect and what was the effect? many had been bound some wives by their husbands and some children by their parents the honest, who, the honest who had been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold upon it and there, there's, there's the change right there's the effect rather all fear of their relatives was gone and the truth alone was exalted to them 
They have been hungry and thirsting for truth who is dearer and more precious than life. I ask what made this great change. Now what great change? A change from being bound to being free. A change from being resistant to the truth of God to accepting the truth of God. The change from the influence of parents against the message affecting them to where it did not affect them at all. That was the change. Now, that's the picture a picture of receptivity on the part of thousands upon thousands of people and now the question is asked what made this change and the answer is it's the latter rain the refreshing from the presence of the Lord the loud cry of the third angel so we find ourselves being brought down now to the point where the midnight cry which is the loud cry is given and this reaches down into the churches and releases those who have been bound previously by parents, friends, brothers, sisters, ministers and so forth and what a harvest of souls there are going to be at that given point of time. I'm greatly encouraged by the statement in the book um, Acts the Apostles where Sister White talks about um, the gospel in Samaria when um, Philip was taken down there by the miraculous power of the angel. On page 109 of the book Acts the Apostles I there read the Ethiopian represents a large class who need to be taught by such missionaries as Philip. Men who hear the voice of God and go where he sends them. There are many who are reading the scriptures who cannot understand their true import. All over the world, men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Prayers and tears and inquiries got themselves longing for light, for grace, for the Holy Spirit. Many are on the verge of the kingdom waiting only to be gathered in. You must say it's rather hard to believe. You look out there in the world around about you and uh, how much visible evidence can you see of the truth of those words? None. Right? None at all. The world looks so uh, entrenched in its unbelief. It looks so uh, hardened against the, the truth of God that you feel that out there there's just no one who is prepared to listen to the truth of God. But strangely enough, they, they are there. I'd like to um, remember, for instance, one experience we had in Australia just a few months ago, back at Easter time to be more precise. We went down to South Australia to conduct the Easter camp. We called Easter because the time it had nothing to do with Easter at all, really, just the time of the year when folk had their holidays. And we started on the Monday before the Easter weekend. And um, I was giving a study about this time in the afternoon and I noticed some of the believers looking out the window outside and I looked in that direction it's a natural response isn't it <laughs> and I saw a man and his wife standing out there and uh, someone went out and invited them in and they came and sat down and, uh, after, and they listened quite attentively and when the meeting was over he came to me and, and introduced himself and told me his experience in life he said that uh, all his days he'd been very interested in spiritual things and had been searching, searching, searching for the real truth. In that search he would go into church bookstores and uh, pick up a book that looked attractive and interesting on the gospel. But he said he was never able to get past about three pages of any of those books in 25 to 30 years of searching. Never get past the third page because he recognised that something in him said that is not the truth. But the time came when he went to a, um, a place where a friend, one of our believers, had spread out some books available to visitors to his home and he picked up Bonnie's to Freedom and read it from cover to cover. And he said, that's the first time ever I've read a book from cover to cover, a religious book. And um, he then got busy reading the other books and reported the same thing so far as each one of them is concerned. And we didn't even, we didn't even have to win him, we just gathered him in. <laughs> And that's the kind of mystery work I like, <laughs> being naturally a very lazy person, I suppose. But, but that illustrates the point that people are out there wistfully looking to heaven for light and they're on the verge of the kingdom waiting only to be gathered in. And you can be sure that when the loud cry comes it will gather in that harvest and in the meantime we will find occasional people who are ready to be gathered in, especially of course when we achieve the salvation of our children and make certain, of course, that we ourselves are truly born again as well. When, when our homework is completed, then God will put us out into a larger field. So we need to grasp this promise. An, an angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light, 
and who is ready to receive the gospel. And today, angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who, who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and ennoble their hearts. The angel sent to Philip could himself have done the work for the Ethiopian, but this is not God's way of working. It is his plan that men are to work for their fellow men. <clears throat> so, as we turn on over the page, we find that uh, on page 272 of early writings, great powers with these chosen ones, said the angel, look you. My attention was, was turned to the wicked or unbelievers, they were all astir. The zeal and power with the people of God had aroused and raised them. Confusion, confusion was on every side. I saw measures taken against the company who had the power, light and power of God. Darkness thickened around them, yet they stood firm, approved of God and trusting in Him. And then follows a description of very severe persecution. And then we find the second coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. Now it should not be difficult for you to recognize a very, very close harmony between the shaking chapter and the chapter on the ten virgins and you recognize that once you understand the ten virgins prophecy which is quite detailed it's a very simple matter to to match to it the prophecy contained in the chapter on the shaking and to see the perfect harmony between these two presentations of truth and the fact the, the beautiful thing is of course that both pres each presentation brings out angles and uh, areas of truth not revealed in the other and when you put them both together you get a much more complete story or picture just as the matching of Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 gives you much more than to read either one of those prophetic uh, outlines in the book of Daniel. This now completes our study of the shaking in our next study period we will be looking at the parable of the nets given by Jesus Christ which demonstrates that um, there are two separations that must take place before God's folk can look up and see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven and those two shakings are also pictured here on the board today I'll just briefly run through them before the time is gone shaking number one is caused by the preaching of a message the gospel was preached here it shook the church and produced a separation shaking number two is produced by a test coming again to the, the, to the last part of the prophecy a great shaking was caused by the preaching of the gospel here in the midnight cry bringing out 50,000 people in 1844 and once again a test achieved the second separation which divided the wise from the foolish the first separation divides wise and foolish from the rest the second separation divides, divides the wise from the foolish or the, uh, the first one divides good and bad fish from the rest of the ocean and the second one divides the good from the bad fish we'll develop that thought in the next study period which we'll meet again, of course, as usual, at 7 o'clock this evening. Any questions you'd like to ask in regard to this, this uh, prophecy? Oh, well, you must have got the point pretty clear. There's no questions. I always say, you know, that if...